all the calisthenics are done. You can sit back and relax and enjoy a feast from the Word of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for calling us to the table this morning. And now as we open your Word, Lord, I pray that we would be fed wonderfully and powerfully by all that you have to say to us today. I ask this all in the strong name of Jesus, and again, all God's people agreed and said, amen. amen. Last week was part one. I hope you didn't miss it. Last week was part one of the most his heroic spiritual showdown in the whole Old Testament, in my humble opinion. And it ended rather anticlimactically, didn't it? With the false prophets of Baal being ignored by their false gods and Elijah sarcastically mocking them. The stage is set. The false prophets are exhausted and bloodied by their frantic, desperate dance with the devil. Do you remember? You remember the scene last week? I hope so. So now everyone waits to see what will God's man do. Oh, he could talk the talk, knowing this God of power, but can he walk the walk? Moreover, will God walk this walk of power with him? How will he begin? What will he do? Moreover, why is Elijah doing any of this? Why, why, is, why is this even happening? May I suggest this morning, what he is trying to accomplish is to let his people know exactly what you need to know this morning. And that's what is uh, crystallized, capsulated in your point. And it's, it's a spectacular rhyme as well. God wants you to turn your heart to. It's such a good rhyme. I'm gonna, we're going to make it responsive. God wants you to turn your heart to. Now, I don't know whether you sit here today far from God in fact, you might, you might be sitting here today, you're not even sure there is a God. You simply need to know God wants you. Sorry, you, you, were, you, were in, you were in sermon mode. God wants you. Or maybe, maybe you know there is a God. Maybe at one time, you, you, you said a prayer, or at one time you were baptized, but since then, your, your heart's been turned. Your life's been turned away to another God. This morning, friend, you need to know God wants you. you turn your heart or perhaps you're sitting here and your love for God has just grown cold. You're, in, in your heart, there's, there's a coldness about you and your relationship with God. God wants you to turn your hearts But what will it take to turn hearts back to God? Let's find out together. Please open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18. We've been there for a long time. In your student Bible, it's on page 384. Uh, my SMCers who have been here for a while, you know what to do at that point. If you're looking across the pew and you see somebody without a Bible and you have one, you know what to do. Just go ahead. It's on page 384 in your student Bible. I'm in 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to start with verse 30, and I'd love it if you would just follow along with me. Or, voila, up on the screen. Chapter 18, verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water 
and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. First, we need to see there is a people called. There is a people called. That's on your outline. There is a people called. Your application, how has or is God calling you back? The call in verse 30 comes from Elijah and is beautiful. I almost stopped right in that first line because it's so beautiful to hear Elijah call these idol-loving, these false God-worshiping people to himself, come, come back, come home. Jesus echoed that call years later as he repeatedly said, come and follow me. Come to me, all you who are weary. Come out of the boat and walk on the water. But it wasn't just that he called them with words. He then began to repair the altar, which had fallen into disrepair. Supposedly this was an ancient altar that was from way back. But it was God's altar and it had been let go. It had been fallen into ruin. Elijah is building it back up with a personal touch that gripped the people. Much like when he said last week, do you remember what he said? The God that answers with what? Fire. With fire. Okay. The Jews knew that code language and their ears perked up. Hmm? The God that answers with fire? Hmm, what's he talking about? But this week in this text, there's a personal touch that gripped them as they saw the prophet doing something. May I suggest it was when he began to work with the 12 stones in verse 31. Look close at verse 31. Those stones weren't just a landscaping element. They were not just mounts for the barbecue he was about to set up. Friends, those stones, may I suggest those stones were a combination of birth certificates, family picture albums, and your Bible all rolled into one for the Jews who stood on Mount Carmel that day. These are spiritually significant symbols that every Jew knew. Turn to your neighbor and say, the Jew knew. Where else do we see those 12 stones? I'm so glad you asked. Genesis chapter 39, the 12 stones on the breastplate of Aaron, the priest, representing the 12 tribes. Aaron was to minister to all the people, all 12 tribes. He was reminded with, with a breastplate that had 12 stones, one representing each tribe. Same with Joshua chapter 4. When he took the 12 stones, Joshua that is, took the 12 stones out of the Jordan River. After they had crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land, he took 12 stones out and he set them up to remind the people, all the people, that God had delivered them from slavery and into the promised land, and they should not forget. He will be with them all together, no matter what. Friends, don't forget the context of this text. This is a split family. This is a divided nation. Israel, the ten tribes, Judah, the two tribes, are separate kingdoms but not in God's eyes. Every Jew knew that even though there were political divisions, even though the kingdoms were split apart, in God's eyes, they were still together. Regardless of the political boundaries that had been set up, friend, how is God calling you back into fellowship? How is God calling us back into unity? Oh my goodness, have you watched the news have you seen what's boiling in Virginia? If there was ever a time that we as the people of God need to, need to come together and say, hold, hold on, hold on. There's more that can keep us together than blow us apart. That's what Elijah was doing when he pulled the 12 stones together. Oh, that we would have more prophets to pull more stones together. But then there's the water. 
Last week, we covered the wood and the bull. And those were standard ancient oper- offering equipment, just like our green velveteen bags that just got passed and your checks and cash. The offering happened out of gratitude and holy fear for God. But what about all this water? Well, let's just remember, again, a little bit of context. Let's just remember, they had just come through three years of what? Was it flooding? Was it heavy rain? Was it high humidity that they had just come through? It was a drought. They just came through a drought. Precious water. The thing the people had prayed for. The fields had ached for. The livestock was living for. Is now being poured out. Big jars of water. Get some more. Wait, get some more. As endeared as the people were when they were thinking, oh, look, he's setting up those 12 stones. How cute. He's pouring water out. What is, what's he doing? Don't he know it's a drought? Whew. Why waste such a precious commodity? Friends, you need to know that every now and then, every now and then, at my house, we throw away bread. Okay? We throw away bread and The reason is usually legit, okay? Either the bread is too doughy or the bread got baked too hard and we throw it away. And and I have yet to go, what if we run out of bread? What what are we going to do? What what are we going to do if we run out of bread? My wife is a professional baker. She makes the bread. I don't worry about running out of bread because I know the person who makes the bread and they're faithful. Why was the water poured out? Because it's not a big deal if you know who holds the oceans in his hand, who commands the clouds and restores the rain. Elijah is saying by this action that you folks are so concerned about water. You should be more concerned about the source. Is that you today? Are you worried about all the stuff of life? All the stuff you think that you need that appears to be in such, such slim supply. Are you worried about the stuff of life more than you're worried about connecting to the source of life? Get it right. If you get connected to the source, he'll supply all the stuff that you need. I just need one amen on that. Thank you. Elijah isn't just putting on a show. He's proving a a point. The only God that created you and sustained you now calls you back to him and will prove himself faithful. He's calling out to you, so turn your heart too. And now I'm going to invite you to read with me and hear the third most powerful prayer in the Bible, in my humble opinion. I'm at, I'm at verse 36. At verse 36. You don't have to read it out loud. You can read it silently. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, 
he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. What you just witnessed is what I would consider a prayer kaboom. A prayer kaboomed. What prayers have you seen answered in powerful ways? And what prayers are you still praying and hoping to see answered in powerful ways? Ways. I'm not sure. Even in our special effects, virtual reality, nuclear age, we can even imagine the power that was unleashed here. We've all seen burnt meat, right? You've seen it on a barbecue. Dad left it on too long, is burnt. We've even all seen burnt up wood. The campfire goes to ash. <laughs> Have you ever seen rocks burnt up? Soil burnt up. Have you ever seen a trench of water just evaporate? This is incredible power. But here's the kicker. It's still available. It's still available to us. In the book of James, Elijah is called just a man. Just a man. Just a person. Just a human. And he prayed. And this happened. I believe God will show up to turn people's hearts back to him. But we have to ask. Right now, is there a prayer that you don't need answered? You need it kaboomed. You don't need an answer. You need an explosion. You need a supernatural fire to light up the mind and lick up the doubts that God is real and ready to turn hearts back to him. I do. Right now, I'm dealing with some stuff that unless God goes nuclear with some people, I don't know. I don't know if they'll turn around. I don't. I'm praying that they will. But they're so sunk deep in sin and they don't even realize that they've been dancing with the devil so long they think it's normal, but it's not. What if we ask God right now for a kaboom to our prayers? And perhaps your prayer is one that requires such an answer. I know not everybody is sitting here needing a kaboom. But for those who are, I'm just going to I'm just going to ask you all to bow your heads and pray with me right now. Lord, there are some people sitting here who need a kaboom. They have loved ones uh, that need to turn to you. And Lord, we, we've tried, we, we've talked, we've, we've, we've tried, we've prayed, we've talked some more, but, but now we just need your kaboom. We need something to happen, Lord that hearts will be turned to you again, or perhaps even for the first time. Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name with the spirit of Elijah that you bring your kaboom. Amen. Now back to our text. I know verse 40 makes some of us pro-lifers nervous. And I don't mean pro-some lifers. I mean pro-lifers those of us who believe in the sanctity of life from the womb to the tomb. I know verse 40 makes us a little bit nervous because we don't like to see slaughter. But let's just remember what part of the Bible we are in. I'm just, I'm just trying to reorient us a little bit. Let's just remember what part of the Bible we're in. Because you remember the New Testament is called the what news? It's called the good news. And so I've always told you that the Old Testament is called the what? The, the bad what? The bad news. I'm sorry, I messed that up. I should have said, the what news? The bad news. You see, Jesus ushered in forgiveness of sins and grace for everyone, for God to love the world. Okay, okay, that he gave his only begotten son. There, that's good news, friends. That's incredible news. 
But in the Old Testament, what was the news? The bad news was this. If you mess with God's people, or if you mess with the relationship with God's people, you're dead. Okay? And, and uh, unless, unless you came in to the Jewish fold, unless you became a part of, of God's people Israel, you better get out of the way. This is why Jesus' forgiveness, this is why the blood he shed on the cross for everyone is revolutionary good news. He kicked open the door so the slaughter can end. We can ask for forgiveness. Today and until the day Jesus returns, we will live with good news of forgiveness. Never take it for granted. Oh, friends, Elijah is taking nothing for granted. Because even though one of the most powerful spectacles of God's presence just happened, he knows that another miracle needs to happen. And it needs to happen soon. Go back to your Bibles. Look at verse 41. Look at verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. He went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go tell Ahab. Hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose. A heavy rain came on. And Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah and tucked his cloak into his belt. He ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. And friends, right here you see a promise kept. A promise kept. Now just remember, Elijah, he went over and did this. Face between his knees. Okay? I didn't ask you to put your face between your knees. He knelt. Okay, he said that wonderful prayer and the fire fell from heaven. Blew up the whole thing. Big slaughter. He knew it wasn't done. He knew he had more praying to do. He knew there needed to be another miracle because rain was promised to come. Remember back at the beginning, a couple Sundays ago, God said, go tell him. Go tell him, Elijah. Now, I won't pretend to understand the relationship between Ahab and Elijah. Why he says to this evil king, party on before the rain comes. Eat, drink, and be merry. But he releases him from the scene, and Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel. He knew more prayer was in order. He'd seen prayer just change people's hearts. Now he's continuing his prayer that it would change the weather as well. I wonder what that servant thought around the fifth time of going back and seeing nothing. Remember? Elijah said, Go over there and look. Go look again. Go look again. Go look again. I wonder if around the fifth time that servant was like, why don't you let me sit here? Why don't you go on lookout duty, Elijah? Why don't you get over there? Friends, the seventh time in the Bible, we know the, the number seven as the, as the number of completion. Never underestimate seven times. Because then on the seventh time, he sees a little cloud, and that's all that Elijah needed. A little bit of application in your emotional drought. In your spiritual, perhaps your vocational or your relational drought. Can you just pray that a little cloud will come on the horizon? Can you just pray that maybe 
Maybe you won't be able to see it, but can you pray that someone else will perhaps be able to see the blessing that's coming and give you some encouragement? The promise is on its way. Friend, what promise are you waiting for? What refreshing, restoring rain are you waiting for? Are you praying for right now? Maybe it's time for you to spend some more time on your face before God. Now we can't leave verse 46 unnoticed because, well, it's a superhero moment. And we're in the We Need a Superhero uh, series. And we should observe verse 46, that is, until you see why it is that he ran so fast. Sorry, but that's next week. For now, I just want you to deeply consider, is God calling you back to a relationship with him? Is God calling you back to a relationship with him? Or has God put someone on your heart that needs to be called back to a relationship with him? Because of Jesus, you don't need to fear getting slaughtered. But you do need to turn your heart. And you need to pray that those loved ones will turn their hearts back to God. Do you need a prayer kaboomed? Will you open up to God's will and say, I will do whatever you need me to do so that I can be a witness so hearts can be turned Lord, I want you to prepare a way for those I love to come back to you. And I think it's okay to pray, oh Lord, please do it. Please do it soon. And perhaps then just get on your face and pray that the reign of God's best, most needed and exclusively available from him alone, pray that that blessing will come on the horizon and come soon, perhaps even today. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I just thank you that you are still in the business of calling people back. And Lord, for that person who is sitting here far from you, I pray that they would have heard with clarity your call to come, come to me. Lord, I pray that they would indeed come back to you. Renew a relationship they can have with you through your son, Jesus. And Lord, for that person who is sitting here today with a heavy heart, Lord, I pray that you would help them to continue to be faithful and to be a witness to those who are far from you that they love. And that you would help them to do what they need to, to help you call the, your people back. Again, Lord, I just thank you so much for your faithfulness. I pray that you would continue to bless us and help us because we need you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.